Thank you very much. We are now at the point to take the opening plenary, and this is how it will run. We will have a short video that will set the tone for the discussion, and then I will invite the panel. But first, let me introduce my colleague, who will be taking questions online from all our online viewers, and then be asking them live right here. Uh, one of the finance MCs around, Mr. Oladele Ogula, is here with his white beard. You might need to remove the. Okay. And so you see him regularly here to take questions online. And so let's take the video and then commence the opening plenary. Securing our future, the fierce urgency of now. The fragility of Nigeria is evident and pervasive in all spheres of its being, economically, socially, politically, and also its integrity as a sovereign state. With a national development plan to reposition Nigeria on the path to a secured future driven by effective fiscal and monetary management and an active commitment to inclusiveness, it is therefore critical to examine Nigeria's priorities for high and sustained economic development. Plenary 1. Building a Secure Nigeria Key Priorities for Economic Growth and Inclusion In the spirit of inclusion, this plenary is interpreted for our virtual audience in Pidgin, Aousa, Igbo, French and Yoruba, Follow the on-screen instructions to gain access. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the panelists for this critical discussion. Thank you very much. And so the discussion will be focused on building a secure Nigeria, key priorities for economic growth and inclusion. Our moderator is a world-class broadcaster, a media facilitator. A lot of young media people have gone through her tutelage. She remains relevant in national affairs. Please welcome here Mrs. Eugenia Apu. As she is stepping to the podium to take her seat, let me also welcome our panelists that will be joining her in taking their seat. Let me first welcome His Excellency, the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, to please. Uh, join our moderator. Let me welcome the Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget, and National Planning, Dr. Mrs. Zena Ahmed, to also join us. I'd like to welcome His Excellency, the Governor of Kebbi State, Chairman, Progressive Governors Forum, uh, Distinguished Senator Abubakar Atiku Bagudu, to join us. Let me welcome Professor Adedoyin Salami, Chairman, Presidential Economic Advisory Council, to also rise and join us. <laughs> Professor Benedict Orama, President and Chairman, Africa Export Import Bank, will be joining us virtually. I'd like to welcome Mrs. Ndidi Mwunili, Co-Founder and Managing Partner, Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition, and Co-Founder, AAC Foods. Your Excellencies, this is the stellar panel 
preeminent, wonderful, world class. Let me join. Let me hand over now to the moderator, Mrs. Eugenia Abu. Over to you. Thank you, Ebere. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, absolutely honored um, to be moderating um, this panel. As you can see, we have a stellar cast of panelists, some of the finest across the world. Welcome to the 27th Nigerian Economic Summit first plenary session, which has been aptly titled the Insight Session. Part of the principal objectives of this summit, as you are already aware, is to foster a people-centered approach to network, socioeconomic, political, and governance strategies with the aim of shaping a secured future of inclusive and sustainable economic growth, leveraging on medium technology, and galvanizing a renewed commitment of stakeholders. As you're already aware, Professor Orama is joining us virtually. We would like to thank him for making the time and for all the panelists who are here present. What can be done better? What are some of the best practices around the world? How can we leverage on Nigeria's human, material, and natural resources to lift Nigerians out of poverty and pursue sustained economic growth? Barry has already done a good job of introducing me. I'm Eugenia Abu, broadcaster, multimedia strategy expert, and writer. And I'm your moderator for this plenary session. Welcome. Our job has basically been cut out for us on this panel, as our session is about building a secure Nigeria, key priorities for economic growth and inclusion. As part of the thrust of our conversation on this panel, the Human Development Report, which dimensions security in all aspects of life, will be on the front burner. Economic, health, environment, personal, community, political, and food security. Panelists are without a doubt the brightest and the best. I'd like to warmly greet His Excellency, the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, our keynote speaker, and say um, to him, Enkwan Dena Metu. You're welcome, Your Excellency. That's how they say it in America. And for everybody else, is Enkwan Dena Metu. Correct? Yes. So, today we have an international personality with us on the panel. And as you all know, every single member of the panel is as international as it gets from our minister who has been doing great work to Ndidi, who is well known in her field, and to Professor, who is here with us, uh, Dr. Salami, and Professor, who has joined us, who is an expert on international trade across the world, and of course, the executive governor of Kebi State, whose work is well known in the area of rice and agriculture. I'd like to welcome all of them collectively, and then we're going to start by asking every panelist to make their two minutes welcome intervention. I'd like to start with the governor of Kebi State. Two minutes intervention on the general thoughts that brings us to the urgency of now, securing our future, the fierce urgency of now. How do you view where we are coming from, where we need to go, and what we need to do like now. I don't know whether I can remove my yes. mask. Let me also join you in welcoming and thanking the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia and all the distinguished panelists and my colleagues. I was recruited for this panel last minute, so I thought Nasiru would have done a better job or the Governor of Nasara, but on behalf of all of us in the uh, governors, um, I congratulate the Nigerian Economic Summit. The, the first summit in 2015, when President Buhari took office, attempted to price the economic agenda 
of the All Progressive Congress. The promises that were made there, and I thought it was a very eye-opening event in the sense that it drew attention to the quantum of resources that we needed. It draws attention to the urgency of um, urgency of drawing, putting those, mobilizing those resources in order to tackle the challenges that were known then. That was not even when we are not, at a time when we are not anticipating uh, the uh, COVID phenomena. We are just talking about recovery from uh, Boko Haram and also uh, other security challenges in the uh, south south and emerging security situation as they were on the northeast. But now, maybe the quantum of resources we need is even higher. And the former prime minister of Ethiopia appeared at a policy session a few years ago with, uh, with Mr. President, and I, happened, I was privileged to be in attendance. And he also spoke about how, about two things that he repeated today, commitment to growth, and then inclusiveness. And I, I think th those, are, those are urgent. We have to, he spoke about pastoralists. In the last few five years, part of the challenges of underinvestment is the, is the anger from the pastoral population. Maybe even the Boko Haram phenomena would not have happened as aggressively as it did if Lake Chad was there to support all the economic livelihood. And now, in spite of all the great work that has been done by President Buhari, in spite of getting the National Economic Council to really be a body of dialogue between the federal and subnational, and in fact, in spite of all the work done by the Federal Ministry of Finance, and the minister is here, thanks to her, and Central Bank, we require much more resources to tackle some of our challenges. And I think for me, that is where the crunch is, because on the one hand, the Minister of Finance is being beaten up daily that we are, we are overborrowed. And then on the other hand, we need more to, uh, to deal with the challenges. And this debate about what the quantum that we require about what to borrow or how much to borrow has happened before. In the 80s, when Nigeria was under, was, 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 had less than $7 billion in borrowing, the Brazil, Argentina told the international capital market and the international community, we need more. We need the, the quantum of challenges we need to uh, support the urgent and invest in our uh, invest in our capacity is much more than is available to us, and I think we are still we are still holding that debate today. And maybe Ayo Salami can help in passioning out how the minister can go out there and tell the world that it's urgent for me, and the most urgent thing is for the minister of finance or the, for the Nigerian economy to mobilise much more resources than we have done all that it can be. The minister with the World Bank uh, encouraged states and federal government to enter into a fiscal responsibility framework. And the successes of that is that most states and the federal government has met all the criteria. So if we can do that, that means we can mobilize more resources. Because for me, at the subnational level, uh, the limiting factor is resource. Um, the OECD average to, to, to run a good primary education system is $12,000 per person. South Africa is at $2,000. No Nigerian state is at $300 per person. And I, like I said, maybe if Mala Nasru has been here, he would have been, it would have been more personal for him because when he attempted to borrow 
360 million dollars from the from the from the from the, from the World Bank, which is a small quantum of what um, Kaduna requires. It was very frustrating for him, both politically and um, federal. Sorry, the, uh, uh, he has to go through the federal government, he has to go through the National Assembly. It took a long time, maybe it has limited the amount of development that will have been witnessed. So Let for me hold your thought there, you. Your Excellency, so I can ask other people's two minutes perspective. So you're talking about inclusion, you're talking about more resources to do what we need to do, uh, you are talking about building the economy, economic growth as it were. I'd like to quickly go to uh, the man, of course, that you mentioned, who you say perhaps would provide us some perspective and enlarge um, the information that we need to hear. And I'd like to put um, Professor Rama on notice that after Dr. Salami has given his two minutes intervention, I'm coming to him um, to ask his um, own intervention virtually. So Dr. Salami, please pick it up from where His Excellency has spoken. There will still be opportunities for you to speak. Please go ahead. Well, uh, thank you very much. And I think His Excellency has spoken well. Um, in my view, there are probably three or four things about which we need renewed thinking and increasing clarity. The first, and which His Excellency has mentioned, is the whole issue around resources. We need to understand that the biggest port of resources anywhere in the world resides in the private sector. And to that extent, one of the fundamental things that needs to happen is that as a nation, we need to begin to understand the dynamics of the private sector, trust the private sector, encourage the private sector, so that the resources that they bring to the table becomes available in, look, when I was a PhD student, and that was before my hair went white, Private sector companies did not build infrastructure. Today, 30 years later, there are instruments that incentivize the private sector to bring money to the table for infrastructure. In other words, the first thing for me is that we need to have a clear appreciation. What can the government do? What should the government do? What should the private sector do? I think for too long, we have lived on this notion of Nigeria as a very wealthy country that the government can pretty much provide everything. It cannot, it will not, and we therefore need to begin to think carefully about what the government should do at the federal level, at the state level, at local government level. That's the first thing. It's also very important as we talk about the urgency of now to understand the dynamics that are going to drive Nigeria. Internally, the dynamics of our population will be critical. The remarks this morning have already drawn our attention to the fact that by 2050, we are looking at double the number of Nigerians that currently are around, 400 million plus is what we are told. The ages are going to be sub-20 for a, an overwhelming piece of the majority. And so the question then becomes, it's not just about jobs, but it's also about, as then His Excellency has said, how do we provide education? How do we provide health care? How do we give them a sense of belonging in a Nigeria to which they must feel committed? So for me, the dynamics of our population becomes the second thing beyond having to think through what should be the role of the government. The third thing is that Nigeria must, in my view, understand her role in Africa and live to that role. One of the points that's been made very eloquently this morning is the role and the uh, impact of the uh, Africa CFTA, the Continental Free Trade Agreement, his Excellency, Mr. Vice President, draw our attention to that. It's going to be very important. There are opportunities out there. You know, some of us, as we have grown older and begun to look backwards, remember Nigeria in the 1970s and the role she played in Africa's independence. Today, I am sitting down 
looking at a global pandemic, and Nigeria is not one of those countries that is, for example, providing inputs into the COVAX uh, facility for vaccines. I see no reason why today Nigeria, if our healthcare system, if our industrial system had developed, we should. These are the areas where Nigeria's role in Africa would be important. Nigeria's economy would be important. His Excellency, our keynote speaker had said, secure Nigeria, you secure Africa. And I, I don't think that could be any truer. And I think the final point that I would like to make uh, in, in all of this is that Nigeria must come very urgently to that position where we become a contributor to innovation. We are currently a domesticator of innovation. But important as that is, it is actually the implementation of what we set out to do that I think is at the heart of our, at least should be at the heart of our progress. As again, we listen to His Excellency, our keynote speaker say, their own experience of industrial parks, uh, shall we say, jam, you know, germinated from their experience of Nigeria's industrial parks. And the key question is, how far have we gone? It's not that we don't have ideas. We've alluded to the National Development Plan, the Perspective Plan. The key question that we have got to immediately find resolution to is, how do we get Nigeria implementing well and as he said sometimes, clapping with both hands. How do we get Nigeria to clap with both hands? Dr. Salami, for your two minutes intervention, we appreciate you. I'd like to go quickly to Professor Orama, if he's with us and we can see him, to make his two minutes intervention, which would be his opening comment at this very, very important opening plenary, the urgency of now. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Ms. Abu. And uh, let me extend my best wishes to our dear brother, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, uh, Prime Minister Desalin, Minister Zainab, Governors, uh, Honorable Ministers, um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, the urgency of now has always been something uh, we talk about. A lot of Africans talk about it. We need to do something about our continent. But it's always been a rhetoric, lip service. Um, we always talked about being a continent uh, that has about 18% of global population, but uh, accounts for 3% of total trade, accounts for less than 3% of um, uh, GDP. The same thing for uh, manufacturing value added. In every aspect of development, we remained at the lowest rungs of the ladder. And we talked about it and laughed at ourselves. But I think uh, the COVID-19 uh, was a game changer. Soon it became obvious to us uh, that uh, those of us who thought we could drop into an aircraft and go and get medical checks or get treated couldn't do that because everywhere was locked down. It became obvious to us that just to get simple face masks was difficult because countries immediately imposed export bans and everybody relied on the capacities to produce and Africa couldn't produce. It became obvious to us that the global supply chains were not uh, in any way linked to Africa. So what that meant was that we could not even produce or buy the simple things we wanted to buy. All of a sudden, we became a beggarly set of people on the continent. And I can attest to that because we were part of the team that were working to make sure that we got PPEs, uh, therapeutic test kits on the continent. And I knew we had to go and beg China. I knew we had to appeal President Ramaphosa to plead with President Xi to give us what we called Africa quota. And that was why we built the Africa Medical Supply Platform. 
to make sure we pulled all the demand to be able to access those. We didn't have to do that. We have all the, all the facilities. We have all the takes, but we never ever pay attention to ourselves. I don't think that given all the things that have happened, that we should let this to continue. The good thing is that our leaders have made a very strong move by signing and quickly ratifying the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. That will be the platform to begin to transform the continent. It should not be lip service again. But you know, uh, the colonial strategy we had, fragmented Africa into 55 atomistic countries. We can never get our voices to speak the same language. We always in a cacophony of voices. But we don't have to all agree. I think we need a few countries to move. And those few countries are the, maybe the bigger countries that have a lot at stake. Nigeria, Egypt, South Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Morocco perhaps. And even the smaller economies that have shown the way in some ways, like Rwanda, like Ghana, for example. But these few countries can pull the others to move. And that's where Africa had moved when it ever wanted to move. Uh, so the urgency of now, I don't think we need to preach it anymore. If we do nothing after all these experiences we've seen, and the fact that climate change will bring more pandemics, it means then uh, that we do not, in fact, love ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Rama. Transnational cooperation the issue of climate change and the importance of no longer paying lip service. Mrs. Wunneli, you have the floor to deliver your two minutes opening comment. Thank you very much. It's really an honor and privilege to be on such a distinguished panel. So I have three main points I want to underscore. The first is the pivotal role of the food and agriculture sector in Nigeria. Before COVID, 57% of household income in Nigeria was spent on food, the highest in the world. Post-COVID, this rate is even more alarming. When people spend majority of their income on food, they can't spend money on education, health, recreation, or anything else. 84% of Nigerians cannot afford a healthy diet. This is a direct link to the burgeoning cost of our healthcare system and the fact that we lose so many Nigerians. Our life expectancy is at 57, and I'm sure post-COVID, it's even declining. Food is medicine. Food is critical for education. Children can't focus in schools if they're hungry. Under five, it affects their brain development. And yet, we continue to take pay lift service to our agriculture and food sector. And it's critical because Nigeria is naturally endowed for agricultural excellence. This is one area God gave us water, land, everything we need to succeed, and yet we're failing. And what is keeping us back? Number one is, a commitment to an ecosystem solution to agriculture. Agriculture is not just the purview of the Ministry of Agriculture. We need infrastructure, we need energy, we need ICT, we need financing, we need every single ministry working together because this sector can create jobs, it can employ our numerous young people, and it can empower our country and enable us to actually have significant ex export revenue, not just in terms of commodities, but processed food. And so I think it's high time we start taking this sector seriously and stop looking at it as agriculture, but food. Because food is growth. Food is currency, food is medicine, and food is critical. That's number one. Number two is youth unemployment. And the minister talked about what he's done in, I mean, the uh, former prime minister talked about what he's done in Ethiopia. All of us see the writing on the wall. Our young people are our biggest assets, and yet we treat them as a liability. Over the last 19 years, through my work with Leap Africa, I've seen what young people can contribute to Nigeria. They drive innovation, creativity, they have energy, they're willing to take risks, and yet we continue to underinvest in them. So what are we doing about our educational system? The ministries of education at the state level obviously have a critical role to play, and some of our states are really leaving, leading innovative efforts, so I commend them. But across the board, we continue to see high rates of youth unemployment, the rates of young people who go from primary to secondary and secondary to university is dismal. Only 30% of our children go on to secondary school, 
5% of go on to tertiary education. What happens to the rest of them? Unskilled, underskilled, and then a bedrock of uh, a pot for anybody to take advantage of. Now, what do we need in education? We need to drive innovation, right? Leveraging ICT, partnering with the great organizations that are providing vocational support, supporting NGOs that have proven they know what to do when it comes to youth unemployment, and really leaving the private sector and the NGO community to do its work, and the government create an enabling environment. And this is urgent, because our young people are leaving this country in droves, and the best and the brightest are being recruited from Canada to Germany to South Africa. ICT has shown that you can be anywhere and do work, and our best minds are leaving the country. And the third sense of urgency is around gender. And I have to talk about women, because I believe we've regressed as a nation in the last few years when it comes to gender equity in Nigeria. With all due respect to everybody who's working on this, if we continue to neglect 50% of our population, we are leaving behind our biggest asset. Biggest our, asset. Our women. Mrs. Moneli, I'm going to give you the opportunity <laughs> to speak about gender as we go along in this panel, because I know that you're very passionate about that. So I'll be returning to you on that, but I'd like you to hold your thoughts for a moment so that we can ask the Honorable Minister of Finance to speak to us. As you heard from Andidi, she's talking about the power of agriculture, um, the dynamics of youth, and food is medicine. We thank you. Honorable Minister, your intervention and your opening comment. Thank you very much, Eugene. I was just really gearing up to hear what she says about gender and you stopped her. I'm looking forward to that as well. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, Excellency, thank you for coming. I, I want to start from the point that Ndi uh, uh, made on government creating enabling environments, because indeed that is the role of government. And uh, President Muhammad Buhari has been one president that has stood out for agriculture, recognizing that you need agriculture and food security to be able to have a secure nation because nobody can develop with a population as large as Nigeria that are not being fed. And some progress has been made in agriculture. It could be better and there's opportunity to do more. And uh, all the states in one way or the other have keyed into the required measures that they need to take to develop one aspect of agriculture or the other. In their seas. And that's very important because it is the agricultural sector that will create the jobs that we need to create to be able to provide jobs for our youth. It is the agricultural sector that we can now we now need to concentrate on and provide opportunities for the youth to innovate on how we can produce better and increase our productivity and increase the yield per hectare. Because it cannot be the same old way in which we used to uh, undertake agriculture that will bring about the desired development. So what have we done in terms of improving the business environment as a government for agriculture, to, for agriculture as well as for other businesses? Because time is limited, and also I'd like to speak about some specific things that we have done in the Ministry of Finance, Budget and National Economy. And for me, one key thing is the innovation that we have brought about in the finance bills. We have so far uh, passed finance bills 2019 and 2020 that supports the national budget and also supports the major in, um, economic development of our country through those instruments of finance bills. We provide incentives for micro, small, medium enterprises in terms of complete tax exemptions. So there's a category that we actually provided zero tax rates for them. These are small businesses that used to pay tax rates of 30%. And then for the middle category, we reduced their tax rates to 20% from 30%. This is something we did before the breakout of the COVID-19. And when, when this COVID-19 pandemic happened on the world, those are the same fiscal measures that other countries were undertaking. So a lot of these things are not being talked about, or even in fact the opportunity that it has provided by, by the um, passage of these finance bills are not being recognized. It's very important for us to ensure that micro, small, medium enterprises harness their resources and they're supported to grow. 
And seeing as we were limited in terms of fiscal space, we're not like the US that had very large fiscal uh, uh, plans and incentives. The, his, his Excellency Vice President spoke eloquently about the economic sustainability plan. So we knew we were limited in being able to provide resources. We did some. So we thought, why not allow companies to retain the revenues that they will have otherwise paid government? In addition to that, we created the Road Infrastructure Tax Credit Scheme that allows businesses to, so this is speaking to the point that uh, Professor Duin Salami has made, to allow um, businesses to use their own resources to build out capital, uh, capital projects, and in this case, specifically roads. So this is a scheme that we have designed under executive order number 007 that allows private sector participants to use their monies to build roads and then recover their investments over a period of time using tax credit. We use the finance bills to be able to eliminate double taxation. We used it to increase the VAT rate. We also used the finance bills to introduce excise duties in the telecom sector, to introduce the electronic money transfer, which we initially called stamp duties, but later changed it. We used it to eliminate, to introduce the automation of tax administration processes, especially in the collection of VAT. All of these things were driven by the strategic revenue growth initiative that we put in place in 2019, and we kept seeking the box. The result today is that as at August 2021, our non-revenues is performed at 116%. That is way over and above the target that we set. But we know that there's still a lot to do, specifically more that we need to do in terms of enhancing the export potentials in the non-oil sector. And that is an area that we have to give a lot of attention to because we need alternative foreign exchange sources to the oil and gas industry in Nigeria. Even though the PIA, the Petroleum Industry Act, has improved fiscal regime and we expect some incremental investments in the sector, but our desire is actually to earn foreign exchange through other sources other than oil and gas. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, the Minister has um, itemized some of the support um, projects that have been done by the government, but she has ended up by saying that there is need to enhance export potential with the non-oil sector, uh, and this is an area we shall be looking at as the panel progresses. Um, your Excellency, um, Hail Mariam, please um, give your two minutes um, opening comment. We know you've already delivered the keynote, but I'm sure there are areas where you wished you had touched. Mm -hmm. Could you enlighten us in those areas? Um, <coughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Eugenie. Uh, first of all, I think I'm, I'm, I'm trying to express myself frankly because I have a stake in Nigeria as an African. And uh, with that uh, mindset, I will try to speak some of the issues which are very pertinent. Uh, the first thing is, I think we are talking now about um, growth and the, how to prioritize growth. Uh, we are talking not growth in general, but a shared inclusive growth. So if that's the case, then we need to focus on areas where we can, you know, do better. We, in Ethiopia, you know, we, we have a say, so you have to ground your leg, uh, you know, in order to walk forward. And one of your leg is going to be on the air, but the other one should ground very well uh, on the ground. So if you just try to float, then you might fall down. And or if you just stand by the, your two legs, there is no forward movement. So you have to start with your first leg grounded and then raise the other one to walk. And now we are trying to fly without grounding our, our leg properly. Where does we need to ground? We need to ground on our comparative advantage. Nigeria has a comparative advantage very well. It is in the rural and agriculture. You have to ground first there and then talk about industrialization, manufacturing, and all those kinds of things. So, uh, as, the, as the governor said, 
I, I got a chance to be part of the summit which the president has organized early on at the beginning of the second term. And I delivered the same speech, almost the same speech. And in, in, in order to prepare for that speech, I tried to look into facts and figures of Nigeria. The facts and figures speak themselves. Look into the poverty reduction in Nigeria. In, in 1990, Nigeria poverty rate was 40, 43%. Today, I also seen the Nigerian Statistical Agency produced a report that Nigerian poverty rate 41%. After 30 years, Nigeria is still in 41 and 43. This fact you can't skip. You have to admit and look into what went wrong all those 30 years. I mean, I'm not talking about one administration. I'm talking about a country. So there should be a continuity of policy and national consensus on the facts and figures where Nigeria is in. To me, in between, I have seen figures that in 2000, the poverty rate of Nigeria was 69%. You can imagine, it was growing from 1990 to 2000. And again, in 2010, it was 53%. So still it's declining, but at a very low rate. So we see there is a decline in poverty reduction in Nigeria, but it's not enough because most African countries at this time are below 20% in poverty rate compared with Nigeria. So I think the major poverty in Nigeria is residing in rural areas and urban poor. If you don't focus your policy properly, the policy choice is very, very essential. This I speak as an, an African, as a Nigerian. Uh, because, because if you don't really see your own comparative advantage, you are going to lose. Look, who is going, as a private sector, who is going to invest in Nigeria rural areas? I don't think none of you in this hall, as a private sector, are going to invest in Nigeria rural areas. Because it's not profitable. You are not working for charity. You are working for profits. Private sector can do in some areas, but in some areas they are not capable or they are not interested in. So who is going to fill that gap? It's the state. The state cannot abduct from the, this uh, engagement in economic uh, development. So I think uh, Every one of us should play our role in order to bring growth and inclusive growth and a shared growth. So uh, to me, I think uh, there should be a national consensus. This is one of the forums to, to, forums to create national consensus in Nigeria. And I think as an outsider, I see that there is a need to diagonize properly and engage and invest in rural Nigeria and in agriculture, and in small and medium enterprises, and you know, move forward by engaging the next step, because our, our leg, which is on the air, is going to touch ground later on. Shared inclusive growth. His Excellency, the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, who is now officially a Nigerian citizen, has spoken. <laughs> he has told us how important it is um, to watch the architecture of walking, the dynamics of putting one step before the other, before flying. And shared inclusive growth is one of the things he talked about and investing in the rural area and in agriculture. This is the first plenary of the 27th Nigeria Economic Summit. Securing our future, the fierce urgency of now, uh, it's time to salute and greet um, our audience that are physically present and to salute, salute our audience that are virtual. We thank you all for coming. We'd like to particularly thank the honorable ministers who are here, 
and all uh, their excellency governors who have taken the time to join us here. Uh, the chairman of the um, uh, National Economic Summit Group, uh, Mr. Igodalo, must be very pleased to see the outcome and the number of persons that have taken time to come here and listen to us for an important issue such as securing our future and the fierce urgency of now. It's time for us to take a look at that call to action, to galvanize, to secure Nigeria's future, to push for sustained economic growth. It would be good for us to hear from the Honorable Minister at this time um, for her to talk us through uh, government solution to Nigeria's challenging economic trends and of course the 2021 to 2025 um, national plan for how Nigeria can move forward one step in front and the second leg behind. Honorable Minister. Uh, fully grounded. Um, <laughs> well said. <laughs> Very well said, sir. Uh, and advice well taken. I'm, I was hoping that this whole of this summit will be in addition to, because we, we always talk about our challenges, but also as we talk about the challenges, we should also be preparing the solutions. Absolutely. Because government is a collective. It's not just the executive or the legislator uh, or the judiciary. It's also the people of Nigeria that is the government. What we have done in developing the medium term national development plan is just for me to say that this is one plan that has been truly inclusive. We have made sure we have brought in every, as, as many shades of Nigerians as possible into the preparation process. So you have the federal government and its agencies, the state represented in every uh, working group. The private sector, women, youths, even political parties were brought in, professional organizations. And it, so the government was providing us a supporter to the process and just uh, harnessing information, agreeing the, what the priorities are, and then putting the, uh, the draft of the plan. We have exposed that plan to several stakeholders and received inputs. So this plan is a medium term plan, but there is a longer term plan, Nigeria Agenda 2050, that is going to be kicked off also, the moment this one is launched, we hope in the next uh, couple of weeks. The medium term development plan has been also mentioned by His Excellency, the Vice President, when he was delivering the President's speech. The objective for us is to make sure that we have policies that are coherent and that they are, that whatever we do, whether it's a budget or any other plan, is actually tied to this national development plan. And this is not a plan for the federal government, it's a plan for Nigeria. We also made sure that we had very realistic macroeconomic framework that was the pillar, that, that was the foundation for the plan. We made sure that this plan had a robust monitoring and evaluation uh, and implementation mechanism, which is unique in terms of compared to other plans that have, have happened in the past. We costed the plan, identifying the resource gaps, and also provide uh, solutions as to who is to fund what. So federal government, state governments, the private sector, we have made those kind of details on a sector by sector basis. The plan is guided by five major strategic objectives, which is to establish a strong foundation for a truly diversified economy. So okay, the Nigerian economy is diversified in the sense that uh, the oil and gas sector today contributes about 7.4% of the GDP, but this diversification has to be deepened. It has to also be truly inclusive. And uh, we also, the, so the next objective is for investing in critical physical, financial, digital, science and technology and innovation infrastructure, because that is important. We are in the, uh, in the stage in the world now where you have to invest in digital technology, in innovation. If not, you will truly be left behind. We also have focused on building a solid framework that enhance capacities to strengthen security and ensure governance, uh, good governance, as well as enable, and the, the fifth objective is to enable a vibrant, educated, and healthy population. Mr. President and this administration have been putting a lot of stock in investing in human capital development, because the assessment of our human capital development index continues to be poor. The states are doing a lot already. We have seen states that 
have the largest share of the budget, some for education, some for health. There's still more that we need to do. And just for me to flag that when you look at the federal government and you say education is only 5% of the budget, that's not the investment uh, that Nigeria is making. The investment that Nigeria is making is the investment by the federal government as well as by all the states. So all of that has to be aggregated, whether it is in health or education. So we should not be looking at these things only with a narrow lens. It's when we look at things more holistically that we have a chance of um, seeing really where are the gaps that we need to continue to, to fill. So the, this plan is also uh, planned around six thematic areas, economic growth and development, infrastructure, of course, public administration, as well as human capital development and social development. Under these thematic areas, we are also going to, we also dealt with strategies that are dealing with all aspects of the Nigerian economy, from agriculture and food security, to integrated rural development, covering also manufacturing, but also not ignoring the oil and gas sector because there's still potential set there, and the improvement in the business environment, the inclusiveness, making sure that women and gender equity was a cross-costing issue in every sector that we look at. We looked at uh, poverty alleviation, governance, defense security, and also the empowerment of our youth. That every sector that we looked at, we're looking at how does this affect the youth? How does this affect the women? Because without looking at what poli how policy affects youth and women, then truly uh, we will not be able to do um, justice to the growth that we desire to have. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. You heard from the Honorable Minister at this first plenary session, um, the work that has been put into the National Development Plan 2021 to um, 2025, and it's at this point that I would like to go to His Excellency, the Governor of Kebu. Can you talk us through the um, agricultural work that you are doing in sustaining the economy and what the role of governors um, in the state should be? You are the grassroots. The people out there need um, um, more push in terms of how, as you heard from uh, Mrs. Umuneli, food is medicine and how that is what is sustaining families in, in Nigeria today. What is the experience of Kebi? Thank you. I think before the experience of Kebi, what is the experience of maybe each of the 36 governors from plus the FCT? I'm sure in all the 36 states, each of every one of us is seeing daily hardworking Nigerians, whether they are farmers, whether they are pastoralists, whether they are efficient communities who are looking for uh, support to do better. Such support may include credit extension, sufficiency of input, or infrastructure support, maybe irrigation that is beyond the individualized offering. And in the last six years, a lot has been done. The federal government has supported us a lot and the central bank has been quite generous with programs that have provided funding. But the, the, the major gap is that the private sector sometimes is not quick enough to provide the intervention that is required beyond the public investment. And I think the former prime minister has said it that maybe it takes time for the model of how to invest in the rural economy to develop in order to make it profitable. So this quantum challenge, despite all the transparency that has been infused into the system, despite the support by the federal government in terms of refunding to states monies commendably, it, it, it has never been done uh, in, the, in, in the size that it was done, despite the increase in um, amount of resources that have gone to support states and to support agriculture. But we need more. And that's why I think more than anything else for me, how do we use this summit? And it's, we are glad it's coming before the commencement of the budget debate at the National Assembly to actually 
bring out the quantum challenge. What kind of resources are we talking about? Um, over the last, the, the federal government, like I said, have introduced a lot of transparency over the years, but yet, due to quantum limitation, the budget that was presented to the National Assembly is about 16 0.5 trillion, which is under 40 billion dollars. I mean, the, that's big compared to my state's budget. And maybe the 36 states is another 25 billion dollars or 65 billion dollars. Maybe the local governments, Nigeria, 10, 15 billion dollars, maybe. So that's about 80 billion dollars. So this is a scale of public resources that is intended to go in supporting an economy of 210 million people. What when you, you like compare to... it to the Brazilian federal budget, similar population of about close to 700 billion dollars, then you can begin to imagine the gap in public investment. When you compare it to um, Egyptian budget in nearby, which is much smaller than the Egyptian federal budget, then you can begin to imagine the, the, the resource I, gap. I'd like you to, to, to tell us what you would like to see. You mentioned the challenge. What I would like to hear, I, I'm, I'm going there. I, I really want to see my Minister of Finance on the international stage telling the world that Nigeria needs a trillion, a trillion dollars and we have the absorptive capacity for it, and we can invest it wisely, and in five years, 10 years time, we can begin repaying it back as other countries have done, and include, get a more inclusive economy that will pull Africa uh, and Africa's over 100 million people out of poverty while contributing to global prosperity. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you, you heard um, the kind of budgets that the um, Governor of Kebi would like to see, and that is basically at the doorstep of the Honorable Minister of Finance. But I would like to say that uh, when we return to the Honorable Minister, she would be able to give perspectives on the comments that you have made. Um, but I would like to go to Mrs. Uneli, and I'd like to prepare Professor Orama that we are coming to him after uh, Mrs. Uneli discusses um, public-private partnership in, as, as part of what you heard from um, His Excellency, uh, the Governor of Kirby State, about how private sector and, and the public sector need to do more in terms of harnessing their resources, their ideas, and pushing forward to improve and grow Nigeria's economy. After, of course, your comment, I'll be going to Professor Orama. So let's hear from you. Thank you very much. So my name means patience, Ndidi, but I'm a very impatient person. And that's why this theme, the urgency of now, I don't think our panel really understands what's going on out there. That's what I'm sensing. I'm sorry. I, I feel, when I think about our country, it makes me very emotional because we have no business being in the situation we're in. And the private sector, a lot of the people sitting in this room are building formidable businesses that are struggling for survival. Because the public sector continues to see the private sector as a threat. I can tell you that the businesses my husband and I have started have not lost anybody to Canada. Why? Because we're providing jobs, health insurance, in the factory, a warm meal. People can provide for their children. You give them hope and a future. So if private sector is given an enabling environment to thrive, consistent policies, not flip-flopping between ministries, changing policies every day, a stable macro and microeconomic environment, stable currency that's strong, security, we will thrive. Then you don't need to borrow $1 trillion because the private sector can deliver. So I'm sorry for sounding emotional, but I, I, can't, I don't want us to waste our time. All of us are very busy people. We didn't come here to waste our time. So I'm, I'm sorry with all due respect. I'm a proud Nigerian. But we can do it. 
We have the best brains in the world. And every single year we come here and I look at the private sector and I say, this, these people could deliver an excellent nation. We know what it takes. So what does, the, what does private public partnership mean? That's what NESG was established to do. We need private sector to influence policy and we need the public sector to hear demand-driven policy making. That's data-driven. <laughs> Our research institutions, in agriculture, we have over 30 research institutions. None of them ask the private sector, what do you need? Is, you know, how can we in, in reduce post-harvest losses? How can we process? Ensuring that we filter this information and we track and measure impacts is critical. And I know that there are people who are working, and I'm not saying all public sector officials are not. We know there are people who are working, but we need cohesive policy making, streamlined, data-driven, consistent with measurable outcomes. So you come here and tell us every year what you have done with the recommendations we have provided and how we're moving our country forward. That's what it takes. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Song Lili. I would like to, I would like to ask uh, Professor Arama um, to hold up for a little while so, so that we can deal with the issues that Mrs. Wuneli has put on the table. I'd like you to hold up a little while so that I can go to Dr. Salami and the Honorable Minister of Finance um, in, in, in dealing with the issues that have been on the table. Dr. Salami, you have been involved quite um, eloquently as, as Chairperson Presidential Economic Advisory Council. Um, are you on the team for the National Poverty Reduction and Growth Strategy? Uh, therefore, I'd like to come to you um, to talk to us about institutional reforms, which is part of that growth strategy. Are we looking at public sector institutional reforms, or we are looking at public-private sector institutional reforms? And tell us now and here on this panel whether the public sector is in a different world, the private sector is in a different world, and um, some, one, some of them have committed some sin and the other have not. Is that, because I heard you at the beginning say government can't do everything. So I'd like you to weigh in here at this time. Well, um, I'm very clear uh, in my head about the need for a clarity on, you see, the, the, in my view, and I spent a lot of my time in the private sector, as uh, Ndidi has said, private sector does have the capacity. And as I said earlier, the private sector does have the resources. It's not necessarily all domestic. Look, there's about $17 trillion of international capital invested in negative yield assets. And if Nigeria today were to secure a regular inflow of say, 40, 50 billion dollars of FDI. And Nigeria does have the absorptive capacity to be able to take that on. And, and the key question then becomes, why not? And again, Didi has raised, you know, very pertinently the question, and, and, and also uh, the honorable keynote speaker said something earlier, and I hope we didn't miss it, that who would invest in Nigeria today if you're looking to make profits. And in my view, therein lies the key challenge. How do we build that understanding? You see, it, it's not about, oh, it's a public sector, it's a private sector. It's about Nigeria. That's first and foremost. Secondly, it's got to be understood that uh, there are certain things the private sector will not do. There are certain things, and therefore, the government should do. But there are certain things the government is doing that perhaps, in my view, the private sector can be incentivized to do. And so, for me, um, we, we need to be very careful. Uh, yeah, His Excellency, the governor of Kebi, is absolutely right. There is a quantum challenge, a quantum of resources that's available. But my view remains that we need to be careful how we borrow. That Countries borrow. If you look at what has happened post-pandemic, global borrowing has risen tremendously. But then for different countries, as when people say, oh, Nigeria should borrow more, should borrow more, should borrow more. I have no, let me state it very clearly. I have no challenge 
in understanding the imperative of boring, but I do have a challenge, is that we shouldn't be comparing, we should compare like with like. Nigeria, you're looking at total resource basket, uh, as His Excellency has said, about 70, 80 billion dollars. When you look at our revenue to GDP ratio as a country, it's about seven, eight percent. When you look at some of the countries against which we compare ourselves and say these are heavy borrowers, therefore we should emulate them, their revenue to GDP ratios in some cases are as high as 30%. When you look at some of these countries, their debt service cost to their revenues. When you look, for example, at an Italy, 200 and I think 10% of its GDP is its indebtedness, but the cost is about 7% on an annualized basis. So these are some of the issues. But coming back to the issue, for me, I don't think Nigeria's real challenge, truthfully, is whether we can find the resources. It honestly is, in my view, whether we can persuade the resources that Nigeria is where it ought to come. Look, at the moment, where we are at is indeed private sector resources seeking to leave. We've been talking about Nigerians emigrating. But indeed, Nigerian capital is lining up at, the, at every opportunity to leave. And the question's got to be, how do we keep it here? How do we make it sustain and grow? Uh, you know, the Honorable Minister of Finance made, I, I think, a very excellent point in her description of the budget, oh, sorry, of the national plan. See, at the heart of it, Rapid, inclusive, sustained, sustainable growth. His Excellency, our keynote speaker, draw attention to the number of consecutive years in which the Ethiopian economy grew at very high rates. If you don't get to that, then taking people out of poverty becomes sporadic. So for me, it's not... Uh, we certainly need to build this whole stakeholder approach, number one. Secondly, we need an elite consensus about where Nigeria ought to be and how she needs to get there. How she needs to get there. It's I'd important. like to stop you there because I'd like the Honorable Minister of Finance um, to have the floor um, because several issues have been raised and I would like you to make comments about the comment that has come from His Excellency and the comment that has come from uh, Mrs. Wune Ling in terms of should we borrow, in terms of how big our budget should be, and in terms of whether private sector and public sector consider themselves um, competitors rather than collaborators. I didn't mean to say Minister, Nigerian government should borrow one billion. I said I would like to see my Minister of Finance on the wall stage saying that Nigeria needs a trillion, whether it's from private sector for private sector, because I believe it will support our private sector. Okay, I, I, that was my understanding. Uh, my understanding was then that you were saying we should go borrow a trillion. So, so I, I get that. But let me start from what uh, uh, Mr. O'Neill said. I, I, I can feel the frustration and the urgency and the need to run. But also, His Excellency said, your feet must be well grounded. Otherwise, if you attempt to fly, you will actually fall. And a lot of us in government have those same frustrations. We deal with them on a daily basis. So I want to ask everybody to really slow down and be patient. Just let's look at our reality and address one issue at a time and get it right before we move to them. We can't do everything. Government is not an expert in everything. Government doesn't have unlimited resources. Government, in fact, has very, very limited resources at this time. And that's why we're reaching out to the private sector. What do you think? What should we do? How do we raise the resources? That's where the Infraco was set up that is made up of government as well as investments in the private sector. The PID and the Presidential Infrastructure Development Fund is also has government funds, funds from development partners, and also to, trying to attract private sector funds. So we can't do everything in one, in one, one, one year or even one administration. We just need to do a plan and actually stay faithful to the plan. If we're consistent in implementing our plans and we put in place, like we've done now, a presidential uh, uh, implementation unit for the implementation of the next development plan, so that there are people who are dedicated to just tracking the performance of the plan, plugging where challenges are, and making sure that 
whatever issues are, um, need to be addressed are actually mitigated on time. The Quebec was a useful exercise, and it was largely a private sector body. So is the, the presidential competitive council. It's also largely a private sector. So we're, do, we're actually trying to do those reach outs, and we do get a lot of inputs. We're preparing the Finance Act 2021. Uh, We've had businesses from all sectors bringing input, sitting with us, saying, we want you to make this policy or change that policy. And we're listening and tracking and prioritizing what can go in this year because you can't do everything at the same time. So we need people to give us those inputs and engage us, as opposed to just uh, challenging without providing the solutions or complaining without providing alternatives. On borrowing, Nigeria, like most countries in the world, had to borrow more than it planned because of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are very uncomfortable with the fact that we had to borrow at those quantum exceeding the, the threshold that is uh, pegged by the Fiscal Responsibility Act. But we've made sure that we have planned over the next three years that the borrowing is scaled down. And also that we're able to borrow at levels that we can actually repay the, 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 the debt service obligation. So our borrowing is not just being done blindly. It's guided by laws. It's guided by a medium term uh, debt plan. We have a board that, that uh, for the debt management office that is chaired by His Excellency the Vice President. So we actually plan these things and we track them. I feel the discomfort from the polity that we're borrowing too much. We're going to leave uh, debts that uh, the future generation has to take. But I think if the conversation can move, move towards what are they doing with the monies that they are borrowing, we do need to build this major infrastructure now for us to have a chance to attain the minimum 70% growth that His Excellency has said. And by the way, that is the growth that we have in, for the medium term 2025 is to attain that 7% uh, growth rate. So these things are being done planned. They are not being done blindly. And these investments will in vindicate us in the future. Thank you. The monies are not randomly borrowed. You heard it from the Honorable Minister of Finance, and she has asked that we engage more and try to find out what is going on. Basically, that's the question, that's the comment that you have made, that we engage more and, and find out what the money is for. And so that's a, a challenge to Nigerians and for us to engage more with your office and with your various um, um, departments. Um, we shall be returning to the panelists, but I'd like to quickly go to Professor Orama, who is waiting at the other end virtually. Professor Orama, uh, you have been for the longest a force to be reckoned with in international trade and finance. How is trade a veritable asset for Nigeria's economic growth? And how is the Afrexim Bank um, working towards assuring that this is useful and, 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 and used funct functionally um, within the Nigerian economic sector? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, of course, um, everything we are talking about today, uh, about the ability to borrow, um, and the economic situation we, we find ourselves in has a lot to do with um, uh, the growth, the economic growth. Um, and that also has a lot to do uh, with the element, what we need to do to make sure that we create a big cake uh, that would even enable us to borrow if we want to borrow. Uh, because you cannot borrow uh, um, beyond your income, and it's the GDP that decides it. Um, trade, of course, we all know that trade opens a country to global competition, opens the country to markets beyond uh, its own, uh, brings innovation, and all those other things uh, that dynamizes uh, an economy. Uh, but I would like to come out to uh, the specific issues of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, because uh, this agreement has been uh, entered into by 54 African countries, essentially because they recognize uh, that it provides a pathway for Africa to achieve the kind of growth we need, the high quality growth we need. 
If you look at the way the world is today, the global relations of trade, uh, Africa uh, produces largely commodities. In a, at a time that commodities as a share of global trade is shrinking, manufacturing as a share of global trade is about 85%, and we are 15%. Now, if you look at the way uh, our trade is organized, you understand why we are in difficulties, why we, are, we will remain in perpetuity in perpetuity if we don't change it, in deficits. Uh, if we export, say, oil, uh, and to export a, a, a barrel of oil, you, you pay uh, shipping, you pay insurance. Maybe some of them are retained, but most of them you pay them out. The oil is taken to maybe Singapore to be refined. When the oil is refined in Singapore, there is a refining margin that is added. You pay another shipping and it comes back to you. Uh, do you ever think you will be in surplus? You will never be. Uh, the only reason we do not see it all the time is because the revenue from the sale of oil, uh, the royalties and all that come to the government. Whereas the people who pay initially for the imports, the fuel we use, those who use it for maybe the energy and all that, uh, they are paid individually. But where do they all end, end up to? They end up at the tables of uh, 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 Mr. Mefiele at the central bank for foreign exchange to be uh, to be bought, to be to pay out. And that's when we begin to see the deficits. And that happens with cocoa, that happens with coffee. Uh, so that is why the AFCFTA is very, very important for us to use it, to begin to move up uh, the value chain and Nigeria has a tremendous opportunity to leverage this. Nigeria has the economic size to take, a, take full advantage of that agreement. Nigeria, no matter what we say, from a manufacturing value added, Nigeria is among the top five countries on the continent, reflecting what the Honorable Minister mentioned about the diversification of the economy. And of course, Nigeria is, a, is an oil producing country with all the resources, including even agriculture, uh, we talk about today. And Nigeria has good initial conditions. Um, we have institutions. They may not well, they may not be working very well, but they are there and we just need to make them to work. Uh, we have Nigerian Export Import Bank, an export credit agency that can be used to support moving to other African markets. But we need to uh, make it possible for it to support the businesses. We have the Export Promotion Council. Some countries don't have all of this. We actually have the banks, and our banks are regional. Usually, banks follow businesses. But in Nigerian case, the banks are leading the way, so the businesses can follow them. Uh, and above all, we have very strong entrepreneurs. Uh, be it the SMEs, if you go to any market in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, you are likely to see Nigerians running shops there. You are likely to see Nigerian products there being uh, brought by informal traders. These are, these are reflections of strong entrepreneurship. And of course, the capacities we have through people we train every day and the population we have. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that intervention, which says Nigeria has strong entrepreneurs, and indeed our population has a lot to speak for us. As this panel comes to a close in the next five or so minutes, we would begin to round up um, this panel. Um, I was hoping that we'd be able to go to the audience for two comments. Um, is that still possible? Where is Eberi? We should go ahead. Two comments from the audience, and would like you to please keep it very, very short because we're coming for one minute closing comments from the panelists. Uh, Mr. Chair has given us uh, permission to do that. Um, do we have free range microphones um, that we can offer those who would want to speak? Or if you throw your voice as I am doing mine now, I'm sure we can hear you. The gentleman in a cap, please be upstanding and keep your questions or comments very short. Thank you. Do, do we have a microphone? We can hear you. We can hear you, sir. Oh, Ebere has a mic. He's bringing it to you. Please introduce yourself very quickly and let's hear your comment. 
Ebere, the microphone. Thank you very much. And because we're gender sensitive, we're looking for female hands up so that we can go to a female next. Thank you. My name is uh, Comrade Issa Aremu MNI, and I'm the Director General of Labor Institute in Ilori. I would like to appreciate the panelists and uh, I commend them for the you know, information overload we've, we've gotten today. But two comments I just want to make on the urgency of now. I think the first urgency is to bring memory back, memory back, memory in our discussion for nation building. And I think Dr. Salami, you referred to this when you made the point that we need to act local while we are thinking African and thinking global. And you referred to good days in the 70s when Nigeria led you know, the struggle for liberation of a number of African countries. I think we should bring memory back. I raise this point. Uh, Madam Patience, I think the reason why you need to calm down a bit is that if we have the sense of memory, there was once in Nigeria in which you had almost full employment for the youth. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm based in Kaduna, if you do, I'm back to learning now to work. But there was once a time in which we used to look around to get youths to work in labor intensive industries like textile. You know, we had massive employment for spinners, for weavers. And I think we need to bring that back. I'm happy in the present uh, uh, address read by the VP. President Buhari read the point the need for labor intensive industry. And the president has taken both steps. We have executive order 003 that we should buy local, buy what we wear. You can imagine if uniform agencies, the army, the police, the customs, school uniforms, you know, we could uh, make sure we produce locally. The garment textile factory will come back. You get these youths off the road and they'll be highly, you know, employed. So I think we need partnership to get this done. The executive has said the borrowing, and I think we should partner to that. Then secondly, the urgency of now is that we should replace despair with hope, even in our narrative. You see, if there are few progress we are making, let's amplify them. I was at Kaduna Investment Summit, and I was impressed. I mean, just within two months or three months, I left uh, Kaduna, my home state. The level of urban renewal that we have gotten now, it's amazing. Even in the condition of insecurity, I'm highly impressed. We need to magnify that. Then for the first time in the life of an administration, about $1.5 billion railway project was completed. Lagos, uh, Ibadan Railway. It's amazing. It shows what is possible. I mean, the same Cardinal uh, Abuja is working. So we need to amplify that. And on the last note, let's learn from our partners. The Honorable Prime Minister of Ethiopia, he spoke eloquently about the progress made in uh, Ethiopia, uh, which has been done very well, and I think I want to, once again, a round of applause for the, for the Prime Minister. He has done very well now. But in his narrative, he was, and I was, I, I was watching him, I, was, I thought it with true light to say that what are the current challenges in Ethiopia? He never mentioned the war going on in Tigray, avoidable war, preventable wars, you know, in which close to 10,000 people have been killed. Yeah. In fact, wars have killed more people in Ethiopia than COVID-19, but it deliberately left it behind. It amplified the progress that we made. I think Nigeria should learn from that. I'd like to thank you, We shouldn't you, be Mr. bogged Isaram. down by banditry, like to thank by you. story of despair. Thank These you. are the few points I want thank to make. Thank you for thank your you, intervention. I'm looking for the hand of a woman. I made a commitment earlier, and please make it a question rather than a comment. Um, okay, so, so there are people rooting for the woman behind the gentleman wearing a suit. There are many women, we can't take all of them. Send to the Secretariat your questions. Yes, you have been well positioned by the gentleman before you. <laughs> okay, so let's go quickly. And you need to, Hello, you, can't, good morning. you can't have a multiple tranched question, just the one. Okay, Please, let's have it quickly. Your name and that question. Oh. No, we can't. Thank you very much. My name is Uma Aboki. I'm Permanent Secretary, Planning and Budget Commission, Kaduna State. My question is both to the Honorable Minister of Finance and also to Mrs. Indidi Ongwe. 
I know that the Honourable Minister of Finance said that we need to break what we need to do into small bits and take one thing at a time because we don't have the resources. I like that idea. So my question is, if we sit together with the public sector and the private sector, what is this one thing that we need to do to begin to address the fierce urgency of now and to begin to move Nigeria forward? Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I hear there's one question online. Can we have that question quickly? And once that is done, um, I'm afraid we can't take any more questions. We need to stop. We're going to the next session and we have overspent our time. So if we take that question, we're going to run through 30 seconds of each panelist and we're done. Let's go. So you already have your questions, I think, Mrs. Huneli and Honorable Minister. And then I'm, I'm going to come to you, um, um, His Excellency. Let's go. Can't hear you. There's a question from Susan Dufan Albert Marco joining from Abuja. And the question is Nigeria is losing its human capital on a daily basis. What measures is this present administration putting in place to tackle this trend? Thank you very much. So I would go first to um, His Excellency for his 30 seconds closing comment. And yesterday, when we were having a conversation, we talked about how can we get youth to be interested in agriculture. We may have missed that in the conversation, but I'd like you to take your pick of what you'd like to close with very quickly. 30 yes. seconds, each panelist. Um, I think, um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the things which I have talked are not dealing with the good governance and also the conflict issues in the respective countries. I have dealt only with the economic performance that has been uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, but like in Nigeria, we, we in Ethiopia has also huge challenge in terms of ethnic polarization and, you know, as a federal state, also tensions uh, within, uh, you know, conflict uh, within a specific federal uh, states. Now, the war in uh, Tigray, for example, which has been mentioned, has its own genesis, which is not directly related to what is going on uh, in the country. You know, when the federal um, government, I mean, the federal uh, structure of uh, the country was, was delineated, it was delineated according to the ethnic boundaries of certain ethnic groups. And that was initially was seen to be a good move forward, but through course, uh, there was a fight on the borders of uh, each, uh, you know, federal states, that this area and this ethnic group belongs to me uh, and kind of uh, things So happen. management of, of, of ethnicities is very critical in, in part of what exactly. Ethiopia did. Yes. I want to thank you, um, um, Your Excellency. I can't take any more comments from you. I'll go to the Honorable Minister of Finance um, to make a quick 30 seconds comment and then I'll come to Mrs. Umuneli. Okay, um, okay. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, to Umi's question, that's a very tough one. One thing. Well, I, I, I should say we should invest in agriculture that will be driven by innovation and technology with the sole focus of creating jobs for the youth. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Mrs. Mooneli, quickly, please, 30 seconds. I'll just end with my favorite proverb, which says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. And I've modified it to say, if you want to go fast and far, which is what we need now, we need to go with integrity, humility, leaving our egos and our logos behind, and working collaboratively to deliver for our people. Because it's about legacy. The future generations will hold us accountable for what we choose to do or not do to transform this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Salami, Human Capital Flight. Well, um, I think with respect to Human Capital Flight, we ought to now understand that the interests of the millennial generation must now top of our thinking. Um, the way they see things is not the way we necessarily see things. And so to that extent, we need to understand. I, I was saying to someone yesterday, when I speak to my father, I'm going to be 60, my father is 94, I stand before him, he, shall we say a little anxious. When my son speaks to me, I was talking to him the other day, oh, you missed out on X, Y, and Z. He says, oh, well, happens. And I thought, on my money, it don't happen. 
So it's essentially about understanding what drives them, and these must be at the heart of our thinking. Inclusive growth. And let's go to you, Your Excellency, to close with 30 seconds. I would apologize to Professor Rama. We would not be able to go to him, but we would like to thank him for joining us. Um, Your Excellency, 30 seconds, two sentences. Once more, thank NESG. In the last six years, we have seen a lot of initiatives, and they are working. In my state, I've seen transformations taking place by very, very innovative programs, both from the public and private sector. And I believe we need much more of that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Professor Arama, let's just see you so we acknowledge that you were with <laughs> us throughout and we are grateful. Just a well, comment from you to say thank you for the opportunity we've had with you. Please go ahead. One sentence. Thank you, Professor Arama. Uh, that sentence is that the Nigeria Secretary has said it's his people and the platform that would turn it out, get it out of poverty is the AFCFTA. I want to thank all the panelists in this first session. My name is Eugenia Abu. It has been a pleasure to serve. Thank you very much. Thank you.